Are you ready? I think I'm ready. Let's do this. Everybody, welcome to the Chemistry Student Podcast. My name is Nick Coral. Edgar, do you want to introduce yourself? I am Edgar Torres. Okay, we are the co-host for the Chemistry Student Podcast. This is a podcast created under the American Chemical Society student chapter for Texas State University. Uh, we basically started this, you know, thought about the idea during the quarantine era uh, that, that started earlier this year, and we figured this is a good way to reach out to our members and still do things uh, virtually because uh, we kind of have to fill that gap when it comes to doing things in person. So we came up with this idea of creating a podcast. Uh, it's the Chemistry Student Podcast because it's for chemistry students by chemistry students. Um, do you want to speak a little bit more on that? And I mean, my 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 overall goal for this and our goal for this was to 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 have some guests on here that chemistry students would find interesting, right? So whether it's professors, you know, IAs, SIs, we have a, a, a list of guests that we think would be really beneficial to, to talk to in, in, a, in a way that we just don't get to talk to anymore. Like, I feel like when we have Zoom sessions for a meeting or, or classes, as soon as, like, the vibe changes to, like, <laughs> the Zoom the Zoom meeting is about to end. Everyone's like, okay, bye. Uh, I'll see you later. And everyone's like a race to the end. I think end everything button. just got like 20 times more awkward than it already was. Yeah. And I feel like I was awkward enough at the beginning. So it, it doesn't help at all that the now I feel like we're all a little socially deprived. Yeah. Uh, so and, and, and it's exciting now that, you know, as I said, this is for the American Chemical Society student chapter. Uh, our first meeting is actually tomorrow. Uh, yeah. A lot of work has gone into it. Uh, the new officer team is excellent. You know, we've been putting a lot of work in. And this podcast is just one example of that. Uh, so looking forward to kind of socializing again in a weird way. <laughs> I had my first in-person lab today, my only in-person lab. And we've already been in, in class That's a week and a half. That's the only in-person uh, school thing you have, right? Yeah, I mean, for now, anyway. I mean, Yeah, for now. Uh, and we can get into that later as well. But yeah, right now it's a vertebrate physiology lab. And uh, it wasn't bad. It was seven people, right? That was it, not bad. I mean, I, I don't have anything to compare it to besides what y'all tell me in lectures that are seem pretty crowded. But, um, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> I am the vice president for ACS, right? Edgar, mm -hmm. you are? The president. Right. So we we kind of started out uh, as members about a year ago, right? Or well, you started a little bit more me, than a year yeah. ago. Yeah. I was going to say for me, it'd be two years ago because I started first semester of freshman year. First semester of freshman year. And I I was so starting out, I guess it's, we should probably say that I'm a biochemistry major. You're a chemistry major. Uh, chemistry and we have, major. you know, our minors as well. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't like that at the beginning, right? We, you know, we, we were talking about it yesterday and we, we went in as nursing majors. Uh, yeah. I did, we, did we both apply? It's, it's uncanny how many similarities we actually have, uh, <laughs> like in our, in our backstory, but, uh, yeah, we both applied as nursing majors. Uh, you changed pretty quickly to biology. Uh, well, actually it took me about like six months to realize that I wanted to do music. Music. Yeah. Six months, you realized it took you six months, you wanted to do music, and then when was yeah. it six months? What do you mean? So I applied at Texas State somewhere like September. It was like early admission or something like that. Whenever it opened, I don't remember exactly. This mm. was like three, two years ago. But I applied as an nursing major because I didn't really know what I wanted. So I was like, I have like an uncle of a, an uncle of a distant family that's a nursing, that's a nurse. Oh, that seems cool. So I was like, yeah, sure. Mm. And then I think it was maybe like January where I was like, you know what? I'm not really feeling nursing anymore. Uh, I really like band. I play a lot of instruments. Yeah, let me do music, right? Uh, and then um, I basically changed everything to music. And it was until June 
I had already gone to orientation. Uh, classes were already said. And I had an epiphany that I was like, you know what? I can't do music as a career. At least not now. Uh, so I chose the broadest of sciences uh, at the time I thought of, uh, which was biology. Biology major. And mm-hmm. Yeah, so I switched to biology. And that's how I started um, undergrad, right? Mm. Uh, took me about a month to realize that I did not like biology. Mm. Uh, luckily, I already had come with uh, credits because of like the AP bio test and all that stuff you can take in high school. Uh, so I started off with like a head start in my bio classes. But because I was a biology major, I had to take chemistry, general chemistry one. And I realized that I liked applying uh, math and other, you know, types of stuff like that uh, to problems and, you know, life problems, really, than memorizing concepts and theories and stuff like that. Now, obviously, chemistry does have its share of concepts and theories, but... I don't know. I found something in chemistry that I could not find in my biology classes. Uh, and I think a lot had to do with, you know, the professor, you know, teaching and stuff like that. Uh, my biology class was around 400 people. My chemistry class was 40, 80. I, I got to say, I mean, the chemistry department here is is one of the best departments at Texas State. I mean, uh, when I compared as, as a biology major myself, I was taking these classes and I, I the effort that was put into the courses, I, I noticed was much greater in the chemistry department, whether it was in labs or lectures, I, I, I found like I was doing more. I was paid more attention to as a student. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was going to say, I felt like in class, you know, and it's funny because the, my chemistry class, my freshman year was, or my first semester was at 9 a.m. My mm-hmm. biology class was at two. So you would kind of suggest that I'd be more awake for my biology class since it's later in the day, but I was actually more awake for my chemistry class and you know, i think that devotes to me being interested in the subject more than that biology course and so because of that uh i decided you know what i think uh i think chemistry is it mm. and so then i changed to chemistry and decided to keep the biology as a minor because i already had credits for it i was already taking a class for it so I was like mm, you know what might as well just finish it with a minor so so yeah so chemistry major Bio so minor. we both moved into the into the chemistry department. Yeah. And you you were getting into ACS, and I heard you you talk good things about it. You said, "Ah, oh, you should come. There's there's free pizza." Uh, <laughs> that and was that's a what big got incentive. me. That's definitely what got me. Uh, I didn't have an organization that I really, I was I was ready to get really involved with. Uh, we went to our first meeting, and uh, it was a small group of some pretty nice when, people. When uh, when did was your first meeting? Do you remember if it was fall? Uh, it was or in spring? the fall. It was in the fall, in the but fall? I I never I don't think I ever officially became a member. Uh, hmm. I think the meetings were during a class of mine, and I found that oh, that's right. unfortunate. So I waited till the spring to become an official member, and by the end of the spring, we both uh, we ran for officer positions. By uh, when? The end of spring. Yeah, the end of spring they did elections. We ran for office well, positions. If, if you remember, in the beginning of spring, I ran for a, a position. It was like an emergency thing because uh, oh. some officers had dropped. Uh, so and it, I was it's like, a complicated yeah. history in ACS, right? And I, I didn't yeah. really become a part of it until afterwards. Um, but to sum it up, there was a, a vacuum and there was a need for more leadership. It, the, yeah. the organization was very centralized. Uh, when we started out, and that was one of the bigger things that we would talk and like, you know, we could, we could really do something here. You know, this organization is pretty small. There's, there's not a lot of contingency with its members, and there's a lot of you know money related to the stock room. There's a lot of money in this organization. There's promise here, right? There's potential. So you know, we would have these thoughts, and we were like, you know, maybe we should run. Maybe we should run. So we we did. Uh, you you were an officer for. Secretary, right? You were a secretary. Yeah, so I started, so that, you know, period in January, where it was kind of like an emergency elections. Uh, we needed some officers. Yeah, it was just like help, uh, help wanted. Yeah, somebody. help pretty much. So yeah. I was like, yeah, like, sure, right? So I ran for secretary, and I did the secretary position uh, spring of 2019, mm. and then all of sophomore year, basically, yeah. So it was uh, spring of 2019, which is when you, I guess you could say, officially became a member. Right. Uh, and then I when started we had, out as the treasurer position. Yeah, I was going to say, so when we had elections at the end of spring, I ran for secretary again, and you ran for treasurer. 
Mm. So we, we did our year, right, as officers, and we, we, we started coming up with plenty of ideas. We were thinking long-term, right? There's a lot of stuff to, to be done in the organization, and we started doing them little by little. Uh, now, you know, fast forward, now we're president, vice president. We're getting, we're, we were, a lot of things were planned, right? At the end of spring, yeah. Camp Cats, the tutoring program was I think uh, the there. good thing, yeah, I was going to say, the good thing about, uh, you know, having this, you know, friendship and relationship that we have is that I'm very comfortable with telling you an idea and I'm very comfortable with you criticizing that idea. And so, you know, I think yeah. the I way think we you bounce... thicker yeah. s- skin after getting to know me. <laughs> De- uh, yeah, I can be a little yeah. honest sometimes, but... As I, I was, uh, as I was saying, towards the end of the spring, you know, or the, the middle of the spring, you know, a few weeks before COVID, a lot of things were happening. Kempcast tutoring program was starting to take yeah. take flight. Uh, I remember started we to had get that a constant room, flow uh, of members. In, what was it? Centennial. Centennial, the chemistry department. Not the yeah, chemistry, we used to get a, like a, at least five or you know, ten people it was, coming in. It was going to happen. You know, it was we were we were getting out there. Um, we had the, the normal events that we always have planned. Uh, it, things were looking good. We had a, a, dem- a demos committee, a demonstrations committee yeah. that was about to happen. Uh, and then, you know, we were sent home for the rest of the semester. Uh, and here we are trying to kind of make the best out of the situation online. Uh, we, we've had a few meetings already as the officer team, and we've kind of spoken about virtual alternatives, right? Um, yeah. The professor's vult- virtual alternative. Uh, lots of planning is going into that. And you know, our first meeting is tomorrow, as we said, and, and that's completely virtual. We've Our approach has been make everything virtual so that we plan for the worst and, and don't yeah. have to adjust as, ba- as, 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 as much drastically you could as, as if we were having, like, weekly meetings in person. I, it's, it's, there's good and bad when it comes to this stuff because, I mean, meetings now, I think, are going to be much more accessible to people accessible yeah you just need access to access to internet and you have to be available during that time but it's not like you have to drive anywhere you don't need a ride no carpool situation uh it's there's no food That's there's the no food um downside yeah at least we'll be in the comfort of our own homes so we can have food and you can just snack on your own stuff there but that's true yeah so there there still will be that social the, the lack of kind of that social interaction of eating together and all that, but I think we'll make up for it in, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, and and with the socials committee that we're planning, I, I hope that really starts to take shape as well. Uh, so I think it will. Going back on the idea that ACS was very centralized, I mean, it was the officer <coughs> team, which was five people, five officers, uh, six officers. I think- Five or six. President, vice I president, secretary, treasurer, volunteering coordinator, social and media I, coordinator. Yeah, right? it'd be like six, six. Six six positions. And we were in charge of the entire organization. Uh, I mean, it wasn't <laughs> no surprise that that uh, there wasn't much of an organization towards the end because it's just too much work for six people to do plenty of things and quality things, right? It, it's difficult. I mean, I'm right now we're coming up with all these committees and all these ideas for ways for our members to have uh, accountability and a sense of belonging and some responsibilities to do whatever it is. So is if you want to be the socials committee chair, you can do that. You can plan our Meet the Professors event. And, you know, these are resume-worthy, you know, bullet points that, that could build yeah. your resume and and obviously demonstrate that you want to be moving forward as a leader. So if you go into a, a chair... Uh, in one of our committees, you know, that shows like, okay, he or she is very interested in, in moving up the ladder, if you will, uh, which, I mean, I really encourage them. And like I said, it's going to make a lot more happen. Uh, it might seem like, oh, you know, Edgar and Nick, they're doing so much, but it's like, no, it's, it's, a, it's a facade. There's a lot going on in the background. Yeah, there's in, a lot in, of, uh, which we call it, it's like uh, behind the curtain. Delegation, like a lot of yeah. the decentralization of, of leadership, um, uh, that's one of the biggest things that, and, you know, both of us have had our fair share in, in leadership experiences. The biggest thing that I've had to really take away from all of them is the importance of delegating, right? You're not supposed to be doing yeah. everything as a leader. In fact, if you're doing your job right as a leader, you you shouldn't really be doing much at all besides overseeing and helping when needed. And 
I'm not going to pretend like I know everything, but that, no, that but is I mean, definitely I think you have something a good that point. is and a common... I think, yeah, right. I was say, I think if, if you go back to, like, the example of, you know, not just our organization that we're part of, but, you know, any organization, if you just have two people trying to do everything, right. I mean, that's our, impossible. We, we spoke about it the other day. It was Medical Explorers is another organization at, at Texas State University for people who are interested in, in medicine. It's a, it's a great organization. It's been around uh, around the same time that ACS has. And uh, I showed you a flow chart of all the leadership positions. Dude, in that. you showed it, me that? It, it was, was kind of like, an eyesore, to be yeah. honest, just because no one who's not in that you know, diagram understands how to look at it unless you spend like a long time. You're like, okay, where does this lead to? Who, where's the chain of command going to? But yeah. that's the goal, more or less, right? I mean, you don't... You don't want it to just be a diagram of three people at the top and then everyone else is just like asking for things and they, they don't, you know, there's no there's no roles for other people. There's no sense of belonging besides just having things provided for. I mean, there's no there's no way to continue moving forward. There's nothing to look forward to besides, you know, free food. And and, you know, as I, I think that doesn't really do much for contingency when it comes to attendance to meetings or events and, and stuff like that. So. I think giving some giving people something to do and something to you know take pride in if you will uh is going to be super important this semester and uh we're going to be doing that through chemcats tutoring program socials committee our uh you know we we want to have a fundraising chair right uh, yeah. for our fundraising committee in the spring you know hopefully we're in person by then uh that could really start to take shape as well and and it, and it doesn't have to be this extremely committed role that you have to fill, but it's something that's like, yeah, you know, I, I did my part. You know, this is our organization. You know, it's not my organization providing yeah. for you. Or, or, or So that that's kind of where I'm heading at when it comes to decentralization. That That's really my biggest goal. And I think a lot of other things that we want as an organization will start to come that way. Um, but as for the podcast... The podcast is really just a way to keep everyone more connected, right? It was yeah. it was a silly idea because, you know, now that we're all online, I mean, I, I feel like I've watched a lot of and listened to a lot of media and on, you know, podcasts, and I, I really enjoy it. And I thought, you know, how cool would it be to sit down with the head of the chemistry department, Dr. Britton, and just, you know, talk about, just you know, his backstory. Him, yeah. what, what does he do? Is it, what is it like to be the head of the chemistry department? I, mean, I have no in idea. All honesty, I feel like most chemistry most students let alone chemistry students don't really even know who dr brinton is or like his position my my biggest mistake my freshman year was just not really getting to know the faculty and yeah. it, it, it it's because you don't you don't understand that your gen chem one professor is also teaching like quantitative analysis and you know they actually are much more passionate about that most likely and yeah if you just ask them about it, they would be more than willing to sit down and talk to you and tell you, like, yeah, there's a future in chemistry. It gets it's better than just Lewis Dodd structures. You it, know? Yeah, was that was my biggest deterrent just, as yeah. a freshman. Is I uh, while I I really enjoyed my chem uh, my Gen Chem one professor, Dr. Gray. Uh, I wasn't seeing the bigger picture. I was a biology major, and I figured that's my route. Um, as a pre med concentration, I, I figured I'd, I'm not that interested in chemistry and. And as you get into it a little bit more, you realize, okay, Gen Chem 2 is actually a little cool. It's, 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 it's pretty cool. Uh, it, 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 it's cool. And then, you know, I changed to biochemistry because I thought uh, I'm doing well and I, and I, I like it. And I don't want to take evolution. I don't want to take, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. I, I don't think that's going to be as useful as maybe knowing organic chemistry. So I take organic chemistry and I'm like, okay, I made the right decision here. Uh, you know, we're we're third years. I don't know if we mentioned that, but we're third year students, and so now we're in biochemistry. We're getting in the upper level chemistries, and I I feel more uh, confident in my decision as my final major biochemistry than <laughs> I ever have. Right, uh, Doctor Doctor Kerwin, biochemistry professor. He said, you know, welcome guys. Uh, first off, I just want to say I'm sorry. Uh, you're third year students and this is the first, you know, biochemistry class you're taking as a biochemistry major. It, and he's right. And, you know, supposedly he's doing something about that. He wants to create biochemistry courses for uh, biochemistry majors that they can take like maybe their first or second year. Um, so that's very promising and I'd love to look into that as well. You know, it's kind of funny you mentioned... Uh 
like potentially doing something about you know why are third year student biochemistry majors taking their first cl- biochemistry class you know in their third year right um something that i was kind of uh, thinking about and i don't think i've talked this is the first time i think i'm going to tell you about it uh but i've been thinking about was that i've definitely told you before how i don't agree that um i might be wrong like disclaimer I might mm. be wrong, but I think that some uh, other majors, like non-STEM majors, such as maybe like the like business majors or something related to that, uh, in their degree audit, I think, might be wrong, I think, uh, they're required to take some type of leadership courses or uh, some type of communication courses. I, I wouldn't know. All I know is yeah. at Texas State, I think one of the... So we were talking about how... The chemistry department is one of the best departments at Texas State. I, I really believe that. I think the best one is the communication studies department. Yeah. I, 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 we both have communication studies minors, and I think we should both talk about that. Because, yeah, uh, well, I was going to, so the, where I was going with this was right. that regardless if the business majors have uh, to take, you know, leadership classes or not, I feel like as a future scientist or anything that you're going to use your science degree in, you should have more material to look at when it comes to communications is just an intro course you know and i think i realized that when um this past year right before you know we were sent home around like february 29th i assisted the leadership conference that was hosted by the uh, leadership institute here at you know texas state and it kind of made me realize when i was in a room for a presentation and the presenter asked you know who here is a business major and you know it's like more than half of the you know, mm. class or room raise their hand. It's like, who's a communications major? And you know, the other, like, half or whatever. And then when they're like, you know, others, right? Like, <laughs> I've never been in that others. Right. Like, yeah. Cat- you know, like, it's it just kind of feel like... Every, it's a every single feeling. class in the... Every single... So I've completed my minor now. Uh, is it 18 credits, 19 credits? I have no idea, to be honest. 17, 18, 19. I, I feel it's like I the think least. besides the, one of the classes that I had to take, that I'm taking this semester, I think I still have to take three more. Okay. Or something well, like that. Well, one of the least credits you really need for a minor, out of all the minors you can get, it's it's one of the the least amount of credits you need. And out of all the classes I took, I, every single time I was the only STEM major, except for one of them, where there was like one other STEM major. Uh, who, and, and this was, it was, it was just so... Like you said, I'm not. I'm not used to being so in that bizarre, other category. Yeah. It's like, oh, really? Look at that. Yeah, and it's like you've always been like, uh, like for example, when I was in my quantitative analysis class, uh, you know, it's that third. Oh, well, it's not a specifically third year class, but you know, it's higher level. You know, you could say it's statistics, or they say like Jenkins two on steroids, right? Uh, sure. When she, when she was asking, you know, like, you know, what's your major to like the class, and she like the first thing she said was chemistry majors and like you know like yeah raise your hand like mm. you know she got to the others when she was like at computer science or something like that so what i was getting at is when i was in that room and the presenter was like others and then you know like three of us raised their hands and it was like me chemistry major uh there was an english major i think and then there was a like math mathematics major or something like that right mm-hmm. my point is that like we that moment made me realize that us as STEM majors, we don't get enough communication courses as we should. You know, for example, me, right? I'm doing a chemistry major to get, you know, a chemistry degree. And I hope to be, you know, a scientist researcher at some point in my life, right? Obviously, science is a team effort. It's not something that's done individually. That is not, you're not born with knowing how to work in a team at all. You know? Think about the damage it does. In in our labs, every, it's almost every lab. It's like the lab instructor has to say, "Hey, you know, it's okay to work together. You can you can collaborate on this. You know, it, you, it's a, please, you know, help each other out and stuff." And everyone's like uncomfortable and socially awkward. And it's like, uh, it, it, you know, yeah, what did you get for number two? And it's like, come on, let's. It's a team effort. We're like doing talk, something really yeah. fun. It's a project. Even I mean, the collaboration. So as a communication studies minor, communication studies minor. Uh, you take an inter, a intro class, you take an interpersonal, a small group, and a public speaking. My God, I mean, how much that is done for Those me. three like, classes alone. 
Like, so as officers, as you know, president, vice president, you we have a ton of meetings, right? I, I mean, imagine how bad our meetings would be if we didn't learn how to have a good meeting in small group communication. We wouldn't get anywhere. I wouldn't have ever made an agenda, and I love agendas more than anything in the world these days. I mean, agendas we, are incredible. We wouldn't and even be recording this. The idea wouldn't I wouldn't have, have the out. I wouldn't have had the confidence to make a podcast. Absolutely not. And I mean, not I'm still very uncomfortable, and it's it's awkward. <laughs> but I think we're getting into a groove now. But anyway, uh, it my public speaking class. I mean, I didn't take it that seriously I, at the beginning. I was like, okay, well, whatever. We're gonna present to the class. It's it's whatever. We we get into it. We do projects. The the class votes on you know the best presentation, if you will. And and it, it turned out to be me. And I was like, oh wow, interesting. I can take I this somewhere. That. Right. I, I can take this somewhere. So they have like a semester long or a, every semester they have a uh, convention. It's called the Love Sp- Love Public Speaking Fair. Yeah, yeah. Fair, like I that. think. Or Love pu- Public Speaking. Um, I wanted to go to that, but I had like a class or something. Conference. Or so. uh, it's, it's by, I, it's, his last name was Love and it's like in his, uh, in his honor that they continue to do this every semester. Um, I, I wish I remembered his name, but anyway, I mean, so the, the top competitors of each class would have a, you know, they would they do their presentations and they would get voted on by the judges for the best one. And it was a whole thing. And I learned so much from my professor, uh, Mr. Hitchens, and, and he taught me so much about public speaking that now I, I can go into it with that confidence because you've had your experience when it comes to public speaking. I mean, you oh, went to a conference for your research and you presented yeah. it. And I mean, talk about how much your communication studies background helped you with something yeah. like that and, and you know i've i was I keep going back to i said you know those three classes alone which i meant uh small group communication interpersonal communication and public speaking i mean the small group communication alone i i had a great professor his name is daniel king you know mm. great great guy great professor you know in the first day i think that i was in the class where he just started explaining briefly the roles that a team should have and how a team should function, that just blew my mind. Because the first thing I thought of was, I'm an officer at an organization, and I don't see these roles. These roles are, you know, they don't exist within the, you know, the officer team, right? Mm. And, I, and I keep getting back at, you know, we can only blame the students so much, right? We can only, you know, say like, oh, you should put more effort, right? Or, oh, you should whatever, whatever, X, Y, and Z, right? If we had more communication courses and i'm not asking like the advanced elective just simple small group communication how to work in a team basically interpersonal interpersonal communication communication between you know two entities right public speaking as a scientist you you need to know how to do that you you can't i mean you you could but you know your reputation as a scientist may and will be affected based on how well you speak whether like you like it or not, right? And where I was going with this from the very beginning is that you said Dr. Kerwin is more than likely going to try to do something about that biochemistry course till the third year. Honestly, I might do something about this degree audit thing because like I don't think it's right that we don't have any more like leadership classes or just simple how to work in a team, right? Now, I don't know how I would do that as a student. Yeah, I should probably... Uh, like if we if you think about it, I mean I'm pretty it, good I mean, friends with Doctor Britton. I think right. Uh, we have he'll some hear network me out, for sure. So, yeah. Um, but even those things take planning and time, years, money. So yeah. How doable is it? We can we can dream about it all the time, but what we can do as a leader of you know a, one of the bigger STEM organizations at Texas State is we can just have our own classes, right? So we're looking into the Leadership Institute, the Youth Leadership Institute. We're going to try and have some some leadership courses. I mean, if we create committees, I want these cha- committee chairs to be confident in what they're doing. So we have these committee, I think it was a leadership workshop. We can have a communication yeah. workshop. I mean, you said at McCoy they have, uh, they offer leadership Oh, that's a, yeah, that's another thing. They so offer leadership, the leadership mentors, Institute, but I yeah. never knew about that. You have your own, so I was correct? So let me just explain that real quick. So at the sure. leadership uh, conference, I was... Um, in a presenter, somebody was presenting and, you know, uh, somewhere in their presentation they mentioned that they were, like, a leadership coach. And I was expecting them to say, like, at another university. And they said, you know, oh, yes, I'm a leadership coach at the 
you know, Texas State, at, what is it, McCoy, I think it is, McCoy Business mm. of School, whatever, right? And I was just like, here? Right? Like, what? Do we have that? And then after his presentation, I reached out to him, like, just walked up to him. And I was like, hey, you know, I heard you were a leadership coach. And he was like, yeah, yeah. I, uh, and he just gave me, like, what he did. And I was like, is that, like, for business majors only? Or, like, who, who can, you know, receive these services? And he goes, anyone. And if you're a Texas State student, you could just ask and, you know, set up an appointment with you and, you know, we'll talk about your leadership skills. Well, I can give you some trainings and I like all this stuff. And I was, in my head, I was just like, why was this never brought up to me? Why is this only advertised at the McCoy School of Business? You know, like supposedly this is for all Texas State students. Now, I'm sure there's some stuff that as a STEM majors we get that business people don't. But, you know, it doesn't even go... You know, down as like a STEM major. It goes deeper than that. It's you know that's a that's people skills. You know that's just you being a human being able to communicate with other human beings. And I meet with uh, his name is Bruce Howard. I meet with you know uh, Mr. Howard. You know, you know, at times when I became president, uh, I met with him uh, in April, and I was just like, look, here's the the plans that we have. Uh, we know it's gonna be hard. But, you know, we still want to try and, you know, do this. And he honestly sat down with me or through the phone. And we talked about every single idea. He, uh, you know, shared the idea of, you know, trying to build the foundation of the organization on three pillars, which then I shared with you. Right. That's where that came from. And there's Talk like other stuff. Pillars. Yeah. So uh, when I was talking with, you know, uh, Mr. Howard, he said, you know, uh, you should always build your foundation on anything on three pillars. You can choose those three pillars to do to be whatever you want. But whatever those are, your organization will follow to heart. Right. And so for ACS, we uh, chose to be a professional pillar, professionalism, social uh, engagement, Right, you know, uh, it would be like social events, stuff like that, and then the third one would be community, right? Giving back to the community, and being really broad about professionalism, you know, that's an umbrella term for leadership workshops, resume workshops, career development, lab tours, industry tour. Like you can put almost anything related to career learning under professionalism, right? Social is, you know, just expanding your network, meeting new people, mm. having more students, friends. Students, professors. You know, students, faculty. professors, in this, like just being able to talk to someone else about quote unquote normal stuff or non-science stuff so that whenever you are talking about science stuff, you're more comfortable with that person. You know, it's, di- mm. it's different when you're talking to someone for the first time about science. Mm. Everyone's going to feel kind of awkward, especially if you're a student, you're going to feel like you don't know anything that you're talking about. But if I know that person beforehand, and then I try to ask, hey, you think I can do research with you? Or can you tell me more about your research? That conversation is then easier to approach when you know the person already, right? So that's the social pillar. And the third pillar, you know, is just giving back to the community. We are, you know, in San Marcos. There are many volunteers. Well, uh, right now, maybe not so much, but I'm sure there are. We just have to look for them. And it's just, you know, giving back to the community just like how much, you know, they might give to us. So, you know, those volunteer events might be going to elementary schools or, you know, going to that, uh, what is that called? We went uh, last year, we went to the river and picked up trash. Um, uh, the river cleanup. The, tech, the, the river Texas. cleanup, uh, Bobcat build, you know, like all these different events. So you're, you're just applying giving this back to the to San the Marcos community, community right? Um, yeah. This can also be applied to, you know, our Texas State community. As, as students, I found it, we can talk about chemcats a little bit. I found it extremely odd that as a STEM organization, we did not really offer any sort of academic services or academic yeah. opportunities, um, at least in the time that I was there anyway. Uh, so I figured, hey, let's start a volunteering tutoring program. It doesn't have to be the biggest commitment. It doesn't, and it isn't. It hasn't been. It isn't, yeah. I mean, well, it has for me and uh, the, the, chair, the co-chair Dylan. Uh, but it's been fun. You know, it's been, it, you get to see something grow. I mean, we had a, we had a tutoring session today, uh, and, and we're on our second week, but two people came in and, and I mean, they're, they're starting to get things that for, for free one, it's super accessible now that we're on zoom. Uh, the technology is, uh, there's a little 
there's a, there's there's issues that are imperfect, but you know we're doing what we can with what we got, and it's it's working. I mean, eventually we want to be the the go to resource for chemistry tutoring on campus. Uh, for sure. You know, sorry Slack, sorry SI, but that that is the <laughs> the goal, right? Um, sorry, it doesn't CLC. mean that it has to be competition. I, right? It doesn't. Like this could be an opportunity to work together. Right now, volunteering, as you said, volunteering is hard to come by. Uh, as a volunteering organization, you know, for ChemCats, you have to commit four hours a month. That's an hour a week. I feel like I'm really busy, and I can still commit one more hour a week to something. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that, that is to say that you don't have to give a lot to get back a lot when it comes to providing for the community, whether that's in Texas State or that's in the San Marcos community. Uh, right now there's food banks you said there's still food banks active um hopefully we talk to jake soon on the podcast but jake hermanson uh he's starting that that project where we kind of come up with some sort of uh, chemistry it, it, it's kind of like demos right yeah we, so it's we, basically it's like a demo uh, in a box like a, right a demonstration yeah, it's in basically a box. a box with a bunch of materials to do experiments and we would deliver you know we'd make them we deliver those to elementary schools, and then additionally, we'd make like a video just showing the kids how to do the experiments, right? And you know, sure. all of that is basically volunteering hours. You're giving back to the community. You're socializing. Like, there's like, yeah, it's so. so it's so little, and we can do so much with that stuff. And so, and you know, it's easy to say like, oh, you know, we're the president, vice president, we can basically do whatever we want. And to an extent, that's true. I mean, I said, I kind of want to make a podcast and we have a podcast now. And we made but it, But yeah. I don't want to make it seem like anyone else in the organization, whether you're a first year student or a fourth year student, that you can't do the same thing. Uh, you know, obviously come to us, pitch us your idea. We can talk about it. We can work it out and fine tune the details and we can really start to expand on some really good ideas. Um, I, I like what we have and what we're planning, but I feel like there's ideas that we haven't thought of that are way better than the ones that we have. And that, that's yeah, up to just sure. collaboration with the rest of the members. So um, I do want to instill that confidence in anybody who does kind of think like, oh, maybe we should do this. You and, know, I mean, please and come I, forward, and I kinda, you know. Just to like add to your point, I kind of think about it sometimes. And, you know, when I was, like, let's just say, like that first semester of freshman year, when I was, you know, in ACS, you know, they, you know, they had stuff going on. You know, it was, it was moving. But I think if... If somebody, officer or not, like that semester in ACS, if somebody would have told me, hey, you know, you could move up. You know, you could be the right. president one day. Or, hey, you know, there are these resources available for you to learn more, for you to move up on the chain. There's promise Hey, in this. take a walk through this lab next week. It's a biochemistry lab. It's, you know, I, I got a friend who works there or does their research there right now and you know, I know that's probably at least a year away from now, but you might actually like what you see. You know, like I have, like as a freshman, I didn't see any labs. You know, I didn't, I didn't get to be like, oh, that looks pretty cool. I might want to study a little harder in my chemistry class. You yeah, know, I, and I was you don't say, get that, that, just, that yeah, it's perspective, right? That gives you back don't get to that you know, perspective. Like when you were in class, you're like, oh yeah, I remember when I was in ACS. They we walked through the biochemistry lab and. Dr. Karen Lewis, you know, showed us this. And now we're learning about it. And so it's cool because, you know, I want to learn about it now because I saw it. You know, it's like, it's such little, you know, stuff like that that I feel like, uh, I don't know about you, but me as a freshman, I didn't have. And I had to find, you know, I had to, I had to look for it. I had to find it because I was curious. But, you know, there are other people, you know, out there that, you know, may not have time to find it. Maybe they're not as curious, but they have that hunger to move up on the chain. And it's those people that I I hope and I wish that, you know, we'll be able to reach this year when it comes to, you know, professional development, social development, and all that type of stuff. If, if we can help people be better people, be better scientists, you know, that's the goal. So I hope so, man. I mean, I don't know how far this podcast is going to reach. You know, we might just be sending this to our friends and family, but... Uh, I was about to say. Eventually, right. I mean, I hope eventually stuff like this, whether it's through the organization, through the podcast, through our, you know, Twitter handle, if it starts to actually reach students and they're like, you know, I, I, I'm only taking classes. I'm, I'm really looking for something to kind of push me forward a little bit in my career. There's organizations, whether it's ACS or the other organizations that we've talked about a little bit already, 
uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity. I, I, I think when organizations are done right and you put the time into them, they can really propel you forward in whatever you're trying to do so for your career. Speaking of that, um, you had a pretty cool internship over the summer. Uh, I did. Out of, compared to most people who had their internships canceled or I was uh, very lucky. postponed, you, you got, she got to go up to Indianapolis, right? I did, yeah. This it was three months, the whole summer, pretty much. So let's let's talk about how this even you even got this opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Go back to like well, you know. I was gonna say, how back should I go? Should I go back to November? Should I go back to the Sure program? Should I? <laughs> so let's let's go back to Sure program. Uh, just okay. briefly mention the Sure program and what you did there, and, th- and how you kind of dipped your toes in the water of research. Yeah. So uh, we're more than likely be having the uh, coordinator of the SHARE program at some point in the podcast, hopefully uh, promoting the program as a whole. Uh, right. She's a very nice person. Uh, her name is Nina. Uh, and it's also uh, another coordinator would be Sylvia. They both kind of work together as a team uh, and make the SHARE program, you know, it is what it is. But uh, just, I guess, a brief description of what the SHARE program is. It's an acronym that stands for uh, Student Undergraduate Research Experience. Uh, and that was, it's basically targeted, uh, as almost a lot of stuff at Texas State, uh, for minorities, right? Um, but it basically gives uh, the opportunity to dip your toes on what research is, how research is, and, you know, if you like it or not, right? So you applied um, as a rem- freshman. Yeah. So I was... Um, I think I got an email about it when I was, like, first semester of freshman year. Uh, and I honestly remember looking at the email, and I was like, I could care less about research right now. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm trying to get adjusted, right? It was the first semester. And then I remember I went back to that email, and I was like, probably not going to take me long to apply, right? And so then uh, they had some, like, uh, lightning rounds, which is basically, um, or was it called speed dating? It was one of those two. Uh, a bunch rounds, of professors right? that, I think it was lightning rounds a bunch of professors yeah. uh, that do research at Texas State they would be at tables and then they'd have like their research description and you'd go around and you know just sit on a table you talk for like five minutes and then you just talk about research and see if you like it or not um, so I did that and I sat with a gentleman by the name of Dr. William Hoffman and you know we kind of bonded I liked his research which was in uh, analytical chemistry uh, a lot of instrumentation, which, thinking about it now, I know zero about. I knew nothing. I was taking general chemistry one. You didn't one, know anything about that. Anything about right. it, yeah. Right, right, I right. was taking general chemistry one, and he basically, I think he taught only at the time instrumental analysis. He would later go mm-hmm. on and teach Gen Chem 2 and instrumental analysis. But, you know, his research was basically the fourth year third year classes, which I'm taking right now and I'm understanding what's going on now. But as a freshman, it was super whatever. So were you like pretending to know what you like? Were you being pretentious and like, oh, yeah, you know, like I can kind of was. So how did you you do your lightning? Yeah. You're sitting in front of him. He's telling you about what he does. You're telling him what? Like, yeah, I mean, in, I'm interested. Yeah. In so he just started and, explaining his stuff. And I, sure. I remember being honest with him. I was like, you know, you know what? I'm I'm just taking general chemistry one. Uh, right. you know, what you're saying to me sounds really cool, but in all honesty, I maybe got like 10% of what you said. And he goes, <laughs> I understand. And I remember, here's the thing I remember. I took resumes to me. I took resumes to that landing round, but I didn't take enough because I'm just cool like that. Uh, enough as in like, I just took maybe like three. <laughs> uh, and three I plan resumes? on giving them... Two oh, professors, as yeah. in like three copies of your resume. Yeah, three copies your, of my resume. Okay, I understand. And I don't know why I took three, but I should have taken more. Uh, but one of them, so I was being very selective of who I gave this to. Wow, uh, you but picking. one of them, <laughs> yeah, I basically I was picking. Uh, and I gave one to him. And that was in November. And then in December, he gave me an email. He you know, wrote me an email and he was like, hey, you know, we met at Lightning Rounds. Uh, if you're still interested in you know, talking about potentially doing research, come up my office, yada, yada. And I went to his office and I saw my resume on his desk. And I was like, you know that he could have easily just picked it up, thrown it away. Right. But, you know, you, you can choose to do that. But he did. As a freshman, I mean, that's desk. what I would have expected, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what they like, kind of coach you in high school, too. It's like, <laughs> you know, you, like they don't care in college is basically what I was told. in Right. High school. You don't get, right. you know, the time of day when it comes to professors and 
it's really interesting once you kind of start to see how not true that is. Yeah. There's I mean, a lot of if, stuff in high school that I was told about college that if you just you not know, actually take yourself seriously and you know you show up to someone's office hours, a professor's office hours, and you're like, tell me about your course. You know, you you take them seriously. You treat yourself They'll seriously. You, you act professionally. They'll listen to you. And a, a lot of people say like, just ask them about you know what they did, what their research was, how they you know, how, how they get their PhD. They'll talk forever. And I mean. Yeah. Like you said, if you only got 10% of it, they probably understand, but they think, oh, they're interested. They're interested. That's, and that was the thing. I, that was, that's what he told me. He's like, I know you probably don't understand much, but you're interested, which is good. Right. right. And so I decided to keep on going with him uh, through December, just talking, just, you know, seeing like what the research group did. did. And I applied to the SHRP program and I put him as my mentor, you know, that I wanted him as a mentor. Mm -hmm. And the short program would basically last from, like, late May to early June. I mean, uh, early, late May to early August was the date. And you would basically do research for the whole summer. Um, I'm not going to go into details because we'll probably end up having a podcast right. talking exactly about sure. But right, right, right. all that goes is I did the short program with uh, Dr. Hoffman as my mentor. It went great. I did a presentation in front of people. It went great. Uh, but the good thing, which, you know, this is going to tie everything with the internship is that because of the SHRP program, I was given $2,000 to basically present at any conference of my liking. Right. So those $2,000 were for the hotel, for the registration, which that in itself is like a thousand twelve hundred dollars Is this uh, like baseline any student in SHRP program after you complete your work with SHRP, they, they give you those $2,000 Everyone had $2,000. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't like earn everyone it from your yeah. presentation or anything? You no, just, no, no, no. I didn't, everyone uh, gets it. I didn't even get like a prize because I, I got like second place overall. I didn't think I got a prize. This was in um, Austin, right? August. So this is to the SHRP Austin. Program. Austin, Texas. No, no. This is in San Marcos. The presentation you got second in? Yeah, this is the short okay, program. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, what was that? Oh, yeah. So then uh, every student that did, completed the short program had uh, $2,000 to travel to any conference they wanted to with those $2,000, you know, with like, for expenses, right? Um, I was, it was September. I, I remember it was September and it was like the, it was the week following Labor Day weekend. So school started on Tuesday. And I was talking with uh, the HLSAMP coordinator at the time, uh, Susan, uh, and she kind of tells me, hey, you do research, right? And I was like, yeah, I do research. Uh, and she was like, have you looked into ABRA camps? And I was like, what is that, right? I don't know what that is. I'm a sophomore, right? Uh, and she kind of just explains it's a conference. It stands for Annual Biomedical, uh, I knew about biomedical research conference for minority students, right? I heard biomedical and I was like, I don't do medicine research, right? right? So I completely was like, nah. And then she was like, wait, maybe they take your research. And I was like, okay, well, it's analytical chemistry. If you find it, sure, right? She ended up finding it. So I was like, hmm, maybe I should apply. And I was like, where is it? And she says, oh, it's in Anaheim, California. And I was like, hmm, I've never been to California, right? Sure is paying for it. And I was like, when's the deadline? And she goes, this Friday. And I was like, I wow. remember that week. You remember that week? I yeah. remember that week. You were driving yourself crazy, typing as fast as you could. And you, you kind of disappeared, honestly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I basically mean, that. So you, I was. You put the uh, work and you got it out in time. I, yeah, I was going to say, I found out on Tuesday. I went to the apartment or to the library um, that night. Type that an out an abstract, send it to my, you know, Dr. Hoffman in the morning. Mm -hmm. He edited it. I edited it back that Wednesday night. Did final edits on Thursday, and we submitted it like Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Right? Crazy, craziest one of the craziest yeah, two yeah, days of my re, life. But I remember. It was definitely like, and the, you know, at this point, you're still trying to get adjusted to classes. Everything is still going on, and I'm over here spending like two hours trying to prefer, perfect 150 words worth of a summer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but anyway, so then, you know, I applied to the conference and I think maybe like I at the same time I applied to another a conference in Austin uh, with the same abstract. I wasn't going to make a new one. Um, and about a week or two later, I got accepted into both. Right. 
uh, which, you know, we could talk about the Austin Conference some other time. But okay, I went the to the Austin Abraham Conference. Camps, yeah. Uh, which I got first place on. Anyways, um, I went to Abraham's in like November and, you know, everything was new to me, right? It was basically like never been to L.A., never been to California. I landed mm-hmm. in L.A. and then uh, took an Uber to Anaheim. P- hotel was super nice. And, you know, if we have time, maybe uh, we can go deeper, deeper into the conference in another podcast. Uh, but I don't know if I told you, but we got there and we didn't have a room. <laughs> We got to the mm-hmm. hotel, and it was like, I remember saying, hey, um, we, we got reservations for Edgar Torres, and then um, another sure um, scholar went with me, uh, Chow Tran. Right, it was you uh, and, and Chow. We're like, Yeah, and we're like, hey, um, we got r- rooms reserved under Edgar and Chow. And then they go, what names? And I was like, Edgar, and then one for Chow. And then they go, we don't have an Edgar or a Chow like, listed here. And I go, Whoa. Right, it's like 9 p.m. in California. It's maybe like 11 or midnight in Texas, right? Where all the you know the coordinators are at. Mm-hmm. And I I don't panic, but I definitely started freaking out a little bit because I was like, we're in nowhere pretty much. I don't know Anaheim. I don't have any family. We don't have rooms. It's 9 p.m. No one's gonna answer the phone right now. It was one of the craziest two hours of negotiating I've ever done in my life. But I basically ended up being like, we paid everything. Like, we paid like $1,500 like straight off the bat. Like, if I didn't have that money there, I wouldn't have had a room, right? Um, worked it out with uh, Nina and Sylvia in the morning. Um, it, but in the morning, it was the start of the conference. So, you know, if we started the conference, in the back of my head, I'm like, am I going to have a hotel room tonight? Like, I didn't even know. Uh, but where I'm going at with this is that, uh, the way that a conference works, if you know you don't know, is that you get a pamphlet uh, with a bunch of sessions, right? They have a bunch of presenters, uh, what you call it, sessions, and they just present on their topic of their choosing, right? And so I went through the pamphlet and I was like, oh, this one seems interesting. Mm, maybe not this one, mm, you know, stuff like that. And then there's like a, a lunch period where there's a, a key speaker is what they call it. So it's basically like everyone in the conference, you know, being in the big big auditorium and then a keynote speaker while you eat yada yada whatever whatever right so i was looking at the pamphlet and i saw a session that was called analytical chemistry in the pharmaceutical development and i was like "Ooh, that sounds cool so it's my research in the pharmaceutical development which i find interesting because at the time i was looking like well what am i going to do with my chemistry degree right so I started looking at medicinal chemistry, kind of found drug discovery and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, pharmaceutical development sounds cool. Problem was that session was like at 7 a.m., right? So I was like, oof, do I want to go? I like, yes, I want to go. I woke up. I went there. The person giving the presentation, uh, his name is Jose Cintron, I want to say. And he's an analytical chemist that uh, works with uh, Eli Lilly and Company, which is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and he started talking about his job, his roles, how, you know, his impact, you know, his work ends up impacting millions of people because of, you know, the medicine that he creates and, you know, purifies and all that stuff. The whole time, although it was like 7 a.m., I was so awake because I was like, wow, this is so cool. Because, you know, he was talking about terms, you know, that you would use in analytical chemistry. And I was understanding every, well, not every single bit, but, you know, most of it. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. I need to talk to him. Right. I, I need I need to speak with him. And so then after the presentation, uh, normally a lot of people gather around the presenter. That's just how it is. Uh, for some reason, not a lot of pop- people did for him, which is great for me because I wanted to talk to him. And I go up to him, wait, like maybe three people. And then I'm like, you know, hey, uh, Jose, my name's Edgar. Just real quick, you know, intro. And I was like, I really enjoyed my, your presentation. Uh, you know, is there any more information that you could give me? And then he goes, uh, there is a booth. For Lily, the, the company, uh, you should come by and, you know, give us more, like, information about you. We can give you more information about us. I didn't even know what Lily was, to be honest. I was just like, this presentation sounds cool, right? So then there's, a set, like, a specific time frame where you can just walk around, like, 
the aisle pretty much and there's all of these like phd programs there's all of these universities industries just giving pamphlets giving free stuff you know just come like know a, about us come just a fair like a job fair or a, yeah a, it's basically okay. that right and so the, he gave me the number of the booth and he said you know come check us out right um <laughs> the stupid in me came out and was like i want to go through the whole the whole, all, everyone in one day so that the rest of the conference, I can enjoy myself and I'll be like, I have these to go through or like whatever, right? So sure. I went through everything the whole day. I was, I was knocked out by the end, right? But I got to the uh, Lily one and I see Jose see me. I'm walking. Jose and I make eye contact and, you know, I kind of go like, you know, I'm about to walk towards you. You know, like it's kind of like signifying like, Come walk towards me so you can give me more info. And then he sees me. He looks at this uh, other woman and then just kind of like nudges. Like, you know, I, I don't even know if that's the word. He just kind of bumps the elbow and then looks at the woman, looks at him, then looks at me and then goes and then like grabs something and goes towards me. And I was like, OK, like this already seems a little weird, but, you know, whatever. Um, and she comes up to me and she goes, uh, oh, hi, um, like we're Lily, whatever, and and she was like, "What's your name?" And I go, "Oh, I'm Edgar Torres. Like, this is me." And then she literally pulls up her iPad with my name already on it, and I was like, "Cool, mm. right? Like, this is a little different, but cool." Um, and she said, "Do you have a resume with you?" And I was like, "This time, I brought way more than three. So I was like, right, "Yeah, I go. do, right? Yeah." And so then uh, I was like, "Here, I have a copy." And she goes, "Oh, thank you." And then she started like just reading through it. And then she she asked me a really weird question. She said, this was a Thursday, right? She goes, what are you doing Friday night tomorrow? And I go, like, what are we? Like, you know, we just met, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know who you are. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, I'm kind of planning my day in the morning or, like, what I'm going to do. Uh, don't really have anything planned. And then she, like, very secretive, pulls out this, like, card out of her, like, pocket and then gives it to me. And, like, this already looks sketchy as it is. So I just kind of got it, and I was like, okay. And it was basically like an invitation for a reception, which at the time I was like, why is this so secretive? Like, I don't understand. Um, and she's like, well, if you have time, you should come to our reception. You know, it's going to be, it's just, she said, it's for Lily to get to know you better, and it's for you to get to know Lily better. I still it was like a private really invitation. Know. Yeah, I still didn't even really know what Lily was, right? But I was like, sure. Uh, so then Friday came. And I'm expecting there to be, like, 50 people at least, right? Because in every session that I've been to, there's a lot of people. So I was just like, you know, this is going to be a big event. There was, like, 10 of us, like, 10 students. And there was, like, Mm -hmm. 12 representatives. Some of the people that I talked to from, like, the booths, from, like, UC Berkeley or, like, Harvard or, like, stuff like that, that were, like, PhD students advocating for their PhD programs were there with me, like, at the same table, like, we were all together. Mm-hmm. And I bumped into them, and I was like, hey, didn't, didn't I talk to you earlier today? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, like, it was just kind of weird. Like, uh, they asked me, like, hey, so, so like, you know, what are, what are you doing? Like, Who are what you? are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, I just got this invitation. And they're like, oh, me too. And I was like, aren't you, a, like, a PhD student? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh. And they're like, well, we you know, where are you at? And I was like, I'm a sophomore, second year. And they're I'm like, I think one of them. Gen Kim too. <laughs> you know, organic chemistry. Yeah. You know, one of them was like, uh, oh, in grad school. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm still an undergrad. And they go, oh, okay. And it was just kind of like that. And then the reception started. And like I said, it was just kind of like an event to get to know each other better and you know, stuff like that. Um, and then at the very end, they end up saying that this was to meet potential interns for an internship to hire. Right. And that's when, like, everywhere just kind of was like, whoa, okay. So, like, this was this, this was about, right? Um, and they asked me, they're like, you know, you're a sophomore, you know, would you consider it? And I was like, I mean, an opportunity is an opportunity. I'm not going to, you know, say no. You know, if you offer it, you know, it's, it's a well, you know, good company. It's a great opportunity, right? I didn't think much about it because I was like, obviously, they're going to get the PhD students. Why would they get a sophomore? Whatever, right? Uh, come to find out, like, a week after Abercams was done, I get a message 
from uh, Maria, which is the woman that approached me uh, with the secretive uh, invitation, on LinkedIn. And she says, can you send me your resume through here? And I was like, okay. I didn't think much about it. At the time, I was really busy with, like, exams. So, like, I honestly didn't even reply to her for, like, a day or two. And she double messaged me, and she, she just she just stated it. She was like, we can't make you an offer until you send me a resume. And I was like, whoa. Like, she basically just laid it out, like, we're making an offer, but I need your resume. And that's when it hit me. I was like, oh, wow, okay, like, I need to do this. And yeah, so you I sent send her, your resume at that point. Oh, yeah, I stopped whatever I was doing. <laughs> I, I sent it. Um, and then a few, like, a week passed, and then I got, like, you know, an official letter with, you know, it was the first time I was, you know, ever looking at stuff like this. Um, so then fast forward to, you know, I accepted it, obviously. And fast forward to... When was it, like February, March, somewhere in April, months just got blurry. Um, <laughs> I get a phone call from uh, Indianapolis, right? And I'm like, okay, the company, sure. Hello, right? And they basically tell me that the internship might move virtually. And it was kind of like a hard thing to take, you know, because, I mean, I understand what COVID was going on and, you know, safety is priority, which I agree with. But, you know, I was really looking forward to going to Indianapolis and being in the labs and you know, doing all this stuff. And the fact that they were like, you know, you might just have to do it from home. It was just like so defeating, I guess, in me. But, you know, I wasn't going to turn down an internship. Right. Uh, so I was like, they asked me if I was OK with it. And I said, yeah. Know, and yeah, eventually right? it turned out it was in person. Right. You flew up to Indianapolis. Well, I actually or drove, you drove up to Indianapolis. Yeah, I drove all uh, the way. Uh, Texas to Indianapolis and you had your internship almost as normal as it would have been without, you know, the global pandemic going on. Yeah, I think a, a big part almost. that I was missing, yeah, it was that, uh, you know, so when what, we got there, uh, yeah, when we got there in June, like early June, um, all the interns and the leadership, no one knew if we were going to be able to go in the labs, right? Like no one knew if we were even going to be able to go into the company. Uh, you know, most scientists were basically told to, you know, go home till further notice, right? Mm -hmm. Because of COVID. Uh, so it's, it was kind of a thing like, well, why do we even want, you know, interns to go in if our scientists can go in, right? So in June, nobody knew what was going on. Uh, starting July, uh, thankfully, because of the leadership that, you know, the internship had, um, uh, we were able to go into the labs. And so my first interaction in the company was in early July. And I basically had a month to get data, results, trials, understand protocols, procedures. In June, I forgot to mention, the whole month of June... Briefly, I let me cut you off real quick. Briefly yeah. talk about what exactly you were doing with Lily. Like in what way? What were you doing I mean, when it came to research? What were you doing your research for? So I was basically uh, helping develop a method to uh, study like protein degradation, right? And what protein degradation is, is just, uh, you know, proteins in cells go through a process where uh, the protein degrades into amino acids and then it's resynthesized back into the protein. And this process is done so that, you know, uh, when cells get old, you know, they need to replicate and stuff like that. It's for those processes. And if uh, we're able to understand that process better, you know, we're going to be able to then uh, figure out a better drug candidate, right? A better, uh, not a drug candidate, a better uh, target protein, right? So in the overall, the way that you would choose, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors in the way that you choose it. But one of them mm -hmm. is the protein degradation, right? So if you have, let's say, for example, a tumor, so... Right. That tumor cell has a bunch of little proteins that are basically making more and more, you know, cells than can you know, cancer and all this stuff. If you find a protein that you can attack, then you can basically uh again, disclaimer, we're not experts in all any of this. Yeah, but we, you we, could I mean, we're third year undergraduate students, so we basically yeah, have no I idea think what that we're should talking be expected, about. Yeah. Maybe if you get your PhD you might have an idea of what you're talking about. <laughs> we definitely we're just we're just experiencing the world, you know, step by yeah. step. 
But uh, what I was going with this is that if if you find a protein that you can, uh, you know, basically attack, uh, you can, you know, take out the whole tumor cell, right? And so the way that you would choose this protein is that you want a protein that will degrade faster than it's going to resynthesize, right? Because the moment you give, you know, a patient or anything like some type of medicine, the cell is going to react by, you know, making more, right? You know, mm-hmm. making more protein, making all this stuff. And so if you choose a protein target that degrades faster than it resynthesized, then at some point you'll just end up with no protein because you're going to take away more than you know, you know what you're putting in. If you choose okay. a protein that you know makes more than what takes away, then you're going to end up making more over time, which you know you don't want that. We don't want to make more, you know, tumors, we don't want to make more cancer cells. And so it it becomes very important to be able to choose the right target protein. And the way one of the ways that you would do that is you would study protein degradation. So basically I was I was making an alternate or not developing an alternate method to studying these protein, you know, degradations and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Right. And that takes, you know, a lot of biochemistry knowledge that I didn't have. You know, I, I still haven't taken a biochemistry course. Right. Uh, and but they gave the you whole, resources. They yeah, they made sure that yeah. you would kind of understand it. You'd have to do a little bit of extra work on uh, outside of your lab, or, but you they helped you out, right? They understood yeah, so your situation. One they of, gave one you of the, the resources greatest, to still be successful. One of the greatest right? like things that happened was you know the relationship I built with my mentor, uh, you mm-hmm. know Jesus Jesus Gutierrez. He you know basically knew where I was in terms of knowledge. And, you know, he knew how to build me up the, the right way. And, you know, okay. he lent me his textbook, his biochemistry, you know, proteomics textbook. He, you know, I basically in June, I learned as much biochemistry as I could. Right. But, he, mm-hmm. and, you know, he was there every single step of the way, making sure that, you know, any questions I had, he was there for. Right. And it, that was so influential, building that relationship with him when it came to August. And it started being super hard. Uh, because as I was saying, June was basically learning biochemistry. July was then learning protocols, trainings, doing experiments, doing results, getting figures, being able to understand your project deep enough so that you're able to present it to other people, which is another level of understanding. And then August was making the presentation, making a technical report, doing all the closing intern thing that you have to do, like sign papers and, uh, you know, work termination and all this stuff. And by the end, I was just like, wow, three months and a half really passed. And it just, for me, it was just like a blink of an eye. But if I look back at it, I see there was so much that happened in in two weeks out of those three months that, you know, it's just kind of like it's mind-blowing when I look back at it. And this unique experience of yours definitely has you, I'd say, ahead of your peers uh, when it comes to your experiences and in, in what you want to do for your career. And I mean, even you, you said you learned biochemistry and you're taking biochemistry now, right? I'm, t- I'm taking next next right. semester yeah. or next semester. Uh, you you definitely a step ahead of, of of your peers when it comes to the courses you're taking because of what you've done outside of your courses. Um, so you you. Finish in August. You did your presentation, right? Uh, yeah. This was a paid internship, right? This was a paid. So that's another thing that I was very grateful for is that there are some internships that basically say your pay is the experience, right? And, right. you know, that, that becomes very difficult when you think about, you know, there's some people, you know, and I think I would include myself in those people that, you know, you need to be doing some type of job in the summer to have some income, right? And so whenever you have to choose from, an experience to income, and it becomes very hard, right? Uh, so that's one of the one of the things that I was very grateful for that it was a paid internship. So you you come back, and now you are. How how what's your relationship with Lily? So since usually what you would do is if you were a junior going to your senior year. Basically, going into your last year of undergrad or graduate school, whichever, because they take interns from any range, um, 
there will be a meeting held by your supervisor, your mentor, leadership, everyone who knew you during the internship, and they would basically say, should we hire this person or not, right? Mm -hmm. They'll basically make the decision of we're going to make that person an offer or Lily will not, you know, be moving with forward with that person or whatever, right, for whatever reason. Right. In my case, I'm not in my last year. I still have two years left, right? So in my case, I the same meeting would happen or has happened, you know, I don't know. But instead of will we offer him a job, it would be will we offer him another internship. Basically, do we want him back, right? So mm-hmm. I believe they told me that they were going to get back to me with a decision of yes or no um, sometime in September, late September, early October. So really, it might be like in a few weeks. A month from um, now, a few weeks. Yeah, so, I mean, if I get offered the internship again, I I definitely take it because uh, it wasn't only, like, the experience. It was the people that I got to meet, and that's because it was through, like, an online, you know, way, and, you know, everything online is just kind of different, and it's a different build, but I realized that, you know, there was one day, and and this is the day that I realized, at 11 a.m., I talked with someone that was from England, at noon, I talked with someone that was from, I think, Kenya. At one, I talked from someone that was from Spain. And then at, like, three, I talked with someone that was from Brazil. And at four, I talked with my mentor who's from Mexico. So, like, in a day... And, and tell me, how did your communications background help you with something like... No, I'm just kidding. I mean, that, but, like, see how... <laughs> re- it, you can tie your communications, you know, education into everything that you're doing in STEM. Everything. It's so helpful. I mean... There's there's so many ways that you can apply what you learn and the skills that you develop when you take these communication classes. Uh, you know, we're not being endorsed by the communication studies department. We're just passionate <laughs> students when it yeah. comes to, like, being good communicators. So uh, I'll, I'll let you keep going. But the, just the fact that you're you're talking with people all over the world um, doing these with teleconferences, basically. Yeah. I mean, if you took a traditional route and you just did your, you know, chemistry major, biology minor, you would have not... You would have been unprepared for stuff one like of, that to, one of the to things collaborate that definitely, like, the, to that yeah, level. Definitely collaboration. It was, you know, I'd be in the lab and I wouldn't know how to do something. You know, it's the confidence of being able to be vulnerable and asking for help. You know, and I feel like if mm-hmm. you don't have that confidence and communication skills that, you know, it's okay to be wrong. Sometimes. It's okay to not know. If you don't understand that in the STEM world specifically, I, you won't move. You know? We didn't talk too much about your internship because we did want it to be kind of like uh, it was my first time hearing about it on the podcast, so that you know the listeners could yeah. be in my shoes. But um, you you did mention that your mentor, uh, she was she talked about how you didn't want to like pretend like you know what you're you you you're doing when you're in your internship, right? To to be pretentious is a very big turnoff for employers and stuff like. Take a speak more on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So that was actually uh, one of the leadership uh, people uh, that basically maintains the uh, the internship. Her name is Marta. Uh, mm. She's the one from Spain, and um, yeah, she was basically she had a phone call with me, uh, basically just telling me that um, she's one of the people that decides if people get a job after this or not or an invitation back okay and she basically gave me a phone call i'm getting chills now because i remember the phone call um she basically told me like look i know we're not gonna be able to poach you right after undergrad for a job you know i've been told by different people around you that you want a phd which is completely okay i'm not saying that's wrong but I already know that even if we try to offer you a job, you know, you come back next summer, you do your internship. Even if we offer you a job after that, you won't accept it because you're set on your PhD, which is true. I want to go get educated first and then, you know, go do my career. Uh, And she was just kind of basically saying, like, uh, when you get out of your PhD program, everyone will try to come get you. Whatever you do. You know, there's going to be companies from the east, from the west, from the middle, from everywhere trying to get your signature. And I just hope and want that you don't forget the experiences that that you had, you know, in this company. Right. And I think hearing that was one reassuring. 
but it was also kind of scary because at the same time that it's, you know, confirming the fact that I did good and people noticed, it's also kind of scary thinking that I'm, this is, there's going to be a big decision coming eight years from now that I can't even imagine taking right now. Right. And after we had that talk, um, she kind of mentioned that, um, uh, how, I don't remember exactly how that conversation came about, but it was talking about imposter syndrome, right? And, and what that is is basically you thinking that you don't know what you're doing because of whatever reason, right? So for me, it was because I was constantly, and I mean, eight hours a, a day surrounded by experts in, in every way possible, right? Uh, and, you know, it kind of felt sometimes like, well, why should I even be here if I don't know anything? Right. And, it's, and it was kind of like, like I well, shouldn't be here. This isn't this doesn't feel right. And imposter you know, and syndrome, yeah. like celebrities go through that. Right. Like movie stars, like one hit wonders are like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. Like, why am I here? Right? I don't deserve right. to be here. Or uh, the thing that I, I would always tell myself is like, I just got lucky. You know, I just got picked out of sure. the bunch and, and I'm here. And, right? and there is luck in, in everything. But you got to you got to take into account that you worked hard. You decided to approach um, I forgot his name at Abraham's, but you, for, you decided yeah. to approach you, your curiosity got you very far. Yeah. And so she was kind of mentioning that, uh, I, I brought that up that I was like, oh, you know, it's cause sometimes like during the internship, I kind of felt like I didn't know anything, but then, you mm-hmm. know, looking back at it, I really learned a lot and I knew more than I thought. And then sh- she basically just said, you know, I'm glad you think that way because I am scared of young scientists that think that they already know everything. Right. And it's it's that's not the case. She said, if you really know your field, whatever field that is, you realize that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Right. And it's that quote that I talked to you about, I think, earlier this week that was, you know, all I know is that I know nothing. And it's in science. You may answer one problem, but off of that problem, you find five more problems. And out of those five, you fix two. And out of those two that you fix, five more come about, right? And she was basically saying that there are some interns that basically think that they know everything in the field and, you know, they don't feel that imposter syndrome, right? And so she was basically saying it's okay to feel that imposter syndrome. You should feel that because, you know, your curiosity, you're aware of your surroundings. You're aware of how small your understanding is. But the fact that you're aware of that you don't know is good. That's how you should feel. And that was kind of reassuring too. That's some valuable stuff. That was uh, some deep stuff. Yeah, I got chills. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Edgar, we've done, what, an hour and 30 minutes? Hour we've and been a half? talking for a bit. Oh, I think that's a good place to stop it then. Um, I think so too, yeah. I think we covered everything we wanted to. You know, this is the first episode, first podcast of Chemistry Student Podcast. Definitely going to be trying to have guests from now on. For sure. Um, And stay tuned for that stuff. I mean, what do you say? Subscribe, like, and subscribe. (laughs) This is my first YouTube channel. Uh, (laughs) That sounds appropriate. Um, Yeah, I mean, let's just call it. Thanks for tuning in if you made it this far. Uh, Bye, everyone. (laughs) Thank you.